Well, good morning. Um, I was asked to set the stage here, and I will kick this off. First of all, to add to John's introduction, and it was a very kind introduction, John, I added it up from my fellow senators. I think there's 113 years of private sector experience sitting here, so <laughs> <laughs> it makes you feel old. Uh, second, uh, every every person here is in, sitting in front of you went directly from the private sector to U.S. Congress, either the Senate or the House. Uh, there was no in between. So this was a, it's a bit of a unique resume, frankly, and I think that that's a different perspective we probably bring to the United States Senate and the Congress of having spent a lot of time outside of the city. Uh, to set the stage, I worked for Procter & Gamble 13 years. One day I got a phone call that said, Steve, would you move your family over to Guangzhou since 1991 and help launch the business for Procter & Gamble in China? My sweet wife, Cindy, and I, with two little ones at the time, an 18-month-old and a six-week-old, we moved to Guangzhou. We were there five and a half years. In fact, David Perdue and I crossed paths in Hong Kong. We didn't know it at the time, but David was in Hong Kong then when I was working in Guangzhou. We had two more babies in Hong Kong, came back to the United States. That really started our journey of interest certainly in China. We saw business go from virtually nothing to a billion dollars in the period from 91 to 1997. I was in Hong Kong for the handover when Chris Patton and Prince Charles handed the keys over to the Chinese government on June 30th, 97. It's quite a moment to see that UD Jeff come down for the very last time. Uh, when we were there, the China economy is $500 billion. Today it's 12, 13 trillion dollar GDP. Uh, as was mentioned by John, I think this is the most important relationship that we have. We think about where we're going here as a world and where China is headed. I was in Russia last week. Ambassador Huntsman framed it very well. He said the China-U.S. relationship is too big to fail because it's the two world's largest economies. The China-Russia relationship is too big to fail because China, excuse me, uh, U.S. and Russia comprise 90% of all the nuclear weapons in the world. So we just came back from a CODEL. I lead a CODEL every year to China, bringing senators and members of the House along. The CODEL a year ago, when we stopped in Hong Kong on the way home, C.H. Tung, who was the first chief executive of Hong Kong after the handover in 97, I was having dinner with him. When I was a young P&G manager back in 1997, C.H. Tong was, he was a, a rock star. It was one shining moment. The whole world was watching on that handover. And C.H. Tong got the keys from Chris Patton and Chris Charles. We're sitting in a dinner like this. We we're chatting about China. And C.H. Tong said, he said, Steve, do you know that the uh, leaders in quantum computing are in China? I thought that's a pretty strong statement. That was with Andreessen Horowitz three weeks later in Menlo Park. We were having a conversation with one of the leading companies in quantum computing that Andreessen Horowitz just placed a big investment with. And I asked him, who leads the world in quantum computing? He looked and says, we're number two. So who's number one? China. The top five banks in the world today are in China. Number six, J.P. Morgan. Three of the top six internet companies in the world are in China. We've got Amazon. Got Google, if you just look at, uh, at market cap and revenues, uh, they've got Tencent, Alibaba, JD.com, we'll visit some of those companies. So, so I, I asked that this delegation visit the technology ecosystem that's developing in China, and that's where we focused our time on the last Codel. I was thrilled to have David Perdue and Ron Johnson uh, come along. I think we all came away changed, and you have one more picture of what's going on in China. I took another trip back to Shanghai here recently, met with John Bruns, the CEO, uh, president of China Boeing. And John Bruns said this, he said, right now the top three airlines by measure by fleet are American Delta United. By 2035, the China Southern Air China. They'll displace the US airlines, the larger airlines in the world. So this is where it's all headed. Quote Wayne Gretzky, escape where the puck is headed. That's why we're here this morning for the further conversation. Who's going to go next? I guess it takes the run around a bit. Well, first of all, I just want to thank Steve. He's done a great job of leading this effort. Uh, and he's, he's got the experience to do it. My own background, I uh, ran a manufacturing company, supplied plastic sheet and medical device manufacturing. We've been exporting to China for probably 20, 25 years. Depending on the year, again, a medium-sized manufacturer, possibly 10% of our sales went to China. So I have a fair amount of experience selling into the market, but not, not living there like, like Steve and David have done. Um, 
as a smaller company, I was competing against bigger companies, I've read Sun Tzu's Art of War a couple times. It's just, it just really is informative in terms of a, a process of you know, how do you compete with some, somebody bigger. Uh, one of the things that Steve's introduced us to is a, a book called The 100 Year Marathon by Michael Pillsbury. And I finally just, you know, finally read it the, last week. I recommend it to everybody interested in China. It, it really puts the meat on the bones of an awful lot of things that you're thinking about and, and really the overall strategy, the overall approach that China is taking uh, toward becoming the world's largest economy. But let's face it, the economy is, is made up of two things, human capital and financial capital. China has 1.4 billion people. They have the financial capital now. They have the innovation, they've stolen our secrets. You know, they've got it, they're innovating themselves. So from my standpoint, what we need to start doing is, first of all, somewhat turn the tables. You know, from a standpoint of trade, uh, because of their intellectual property theft, uh, because of the way they're, they, their mercantilist way of doing business, they've been winning. And the rest of the trading world has been losing. And President Trump's absolutely right along that line. But I don't believe we're going to have the capability of turning the tables where it's a, a, a win-lose win situation, where we win and they lose. We need to figure out, like, first of all, understanding exactly how they do these things. They've, they've been approaching... Uh, world competition, geopolitics, uh, hegemons, for millennia, the exact same way, they're doing the exact same way now. We need to understand that and figure out somehow to develop a relationship where it's a win-win. And not delude ourselves. I mean, for, for decades, U.S. policy has been, ever since uh, Nixon opened it up as well, if, if, we bring, if we bring a free market system to them, if we show them freedom and democracy, you know, obviously they're going to adopt it, right, because it makes so much sense. Wrong. It's a completely different culture. It is a proud culture. Steve kept reminding us on our Codell that uh, when the birth of our nation, China was the largest economy. I know, they had the most people. You know, they have the most people, they'll be the largest economy again. So it is inevitable. There's no sense denying it. Recognize that reality, but fully recognize the reality in terms of how they approach things. And we need to figure out how to manage that relationship cooperatively. And from my standpoint, this will be my final uh, word. Have, being in a trade war with everybody is not going to work. We ought to be allied as the rest of the trading world against China to insist that they follow the rules. It's the only way this is going to work. And, you know, I guess one last point. Right now, our top priority in our relationship with China is we need to get them to continue to maintain the sanctions against North Korea because that's an incredibly dangerous situation. Turn it over to David. Well, I, I play a little baseball, so I'm used to that. Um, um, you know, I first started watching China in the mid-80s when Deng Xiaoping started bringing them out. And I remember as a young guy reading about the Cultural Revolution. Now, in this trip that we just made, we met with three of the top eight people in the Politburo, all of whom suffered through and were victims of the Cultural Revolution. I had lunch with the uh, Chinese ambassador to the United States Tuesday this week. He was telling me his story when he was 13. He was taken off of Shanghai up to a farm for five years as a 13-year-old until he was 18. In the formative years of a young man's life, he was taken away from his family, stuck in a little commune on the border of uh, Manchuria. And that's these people were formed by the Mao era. Now fast forward, in 1789, as, as you just heard, they had the largest economy. What has happened since then, they feel like that because of Western colonialism, they had 200 years of downtrodden you know, performance. And they want their rightful place back. For 5,000 years, they saw themselves as the hegemon in the world. 5,000 years. We're 200 years. And when you start thinking about that comparison, therein lies the difficulty in opening up a trade conversation to talk about equality. Because when you talk about um, reciprocity, the assumption in the conversation is that both parties see themselves as equal. That just doesn't happen in this case. I will tell you that in my opinion, uh, watching this over the last uh, 30 years or so, we got it wrong. Pillsbury is writing about it. Hank Paulson has a book. He's writing about it. We all got it wrong. We thought, just as you just heard, that as they became more um, uh, affluent, developed the middle class, became a, a, a member of the community of nations, that they would open up and, and live on. That's what Deng Xiaoping talked about. And Deng Xiaoping uh, convinced us all, and I think all of us, I remember Michael Shinoy was the CNN uh, guy in Beijing. Remember that? It was a source of information about what was going on. 
and we all just saw the hope that we all had as the West that this burgeoning giant here would then move toward more of a conciliatory stance. That just hasn't happened. And so what we see now with China 2025, made China 2025, I believe China has now gotten to the point, I think they've overreached, I think they've misread what happened in the last decade under Barack Obama. Uh, I think they misread America. What they're now saying in China 25, they've made it visible. They talked about their plan, their 100 year plan. And by 2025, 12 years of technology, they want to dominate. Today, 90% of the chips that go into China are our chips. The ZTE phone you've heard about recently, 75% of the chips in that phone are US chips. So they need us for a period of time, but they, I believe they've gotten to the point, and there are others who believe this, that they believe now we either can't or won't stop their march to become and regain the hegemon position that they had. President Xi Jinping gave a speech a few weeks ago where he said, you know, uh, he quoted Confucius, and they do this a lot in contemporary leadership over there. They, com they, com uh, they compare this period to the Warring States period to some degree, from 400 BC to 400 AD, and they quote those people from that and, and those events uh, periodically. They did it when we rode there. President Xi Jinping gave this speech, and he said, and he quoted Confucius, said, just like there can't be two suns in the sky, there can no longer be two emperors on the earth. And the word for emperor can also be hegemon. So it's very clear they see their rightful place as the rule maker. And you imagine, well, that'll never happen here. We have our freedoms and liberty. Let me remind you what just happened to GAP. Remember what happened to GAP? They put this controversial T-shirt out. The Chinese government didn't like it. What happened? GAP pulled the T-shirt. Why? Because GAP has a growing business. In China. It affects our freedoms right here, right now, already today. I believe, this is just one person's opinion, that what's going to dominate the next 50 years, and you can you can read it in, they have a 100-year plan basically from 49 to 2049, <clears throat> that they were going to regain their hegemon position. And I believe the struggle in the world is going to be between self-determination countries and state-controlled countries. Now today, you have two dominant state-controlled countries, Russia, which is a very, very small economy, and China, which is a growing economy. They see themselves as the largest developing economy. They see us as the largest developed economy. And therein lies the imbalance when you start talking about trade because they still see that they are they deserve an imbalanced trading platform. And so what we see right now on the the way I look at it is this. If you take all the self-determination countries in the world, it's about fifty-five or sixty trillion dollars of, of economic production capability in GDP, measured by GDP. They have about fifteen all in today. But as as uh, Ron just said, the allied relationships we have is what Russia and China do not have today. I just went to Shangri-La, it was a military conference in Singapore, and the number one real, uh, revelation I got from that meeting was that they are absolutely prying apart the relationships that we have with our Southeast and East Asia partners, and it is devastating. It's amazing how much progress they've made. The propaganda is absolutely stronger than Russia's propaganda in Eastern Europe. So I believe that's the struggle for the next 50 years. I'm delighted to be here. I'm honored to be on this uh, dice with these two guys. Thank you for your interest. It's the dominant hot topic for the next uh, 50 to 100 years in America. John, before you ask the questions, do, uh, David brought up a great point about how the West got China wrong. I think that's, that's kind of the latest thinking here. I was in Beijing interviewing students, recruiting a team for Procter & Gamble in 1992. These students had been in Tiananmen Square. And there was, it was giving rise to hope Somehow that the, the uh, liberalization of the economy would liberalize the way the government works. The opposite has happened. It's much more authoritarian. One great way to look at that is look at the front page of the China Daily from the 03, 08, 13, 18 elections. In 03, they put four pictures in the China Daily on the front page. In 08, it was three pictures. In 13, it was two pictures. In 18, it's one great big picture of now the president for life, Xi Jinping. We got that wrong. They're much more authoritarian, and we need to keep one eye clearly on the huge opportunity that China presents for companies in U.S. business. The other eye needs to be clearly on the very real threat that China presents right now to the world order. Thank you very much. We are going to move to the Q&A portion of uh, the agenda. We've got a few minutes to take questions. And uh, <clears throat> while I uh, wait for some of you to come up with good questions for them, I'll ask the first one. Uh, as, as I'm sure you know, Senators, uh, Ripon members here in the room today represent companies that really transcend almost every sector of the U.S. economy. 
when uh, companies like ours think about you know the trade-offs and choices around in policy, you know we always uh, prefer good policy to bad policy. But given the choice between bad policy and uncertainty, bad policy is better. You can plan around it. It's a fixed object. It's a terrible choice to have to make. And we're entering a a period of uncertainty as we enter uh, the, the trade war. Uh, Senator Johnson, you, you specifically mentioned uh, you know, the, this uh, in your remarks. I was wondering if you could each comment on what effect you think the, the trade war will have on our economic relationship and our diplomatic relationship and how you think it will end up. Well, I'll start. First of all, one thing we did mention is one huge disadvantage America has dealing with China is they are very long-term thinking. It's just cultural, as well as now structural in terms of authoritarian government. Think, think about the U.S., we become increasingly short-term thinking. If you throw on top of that bad policy that changes from administration to administration, uh, and, and we really are behind the eight ball here in terms of trying to deal with them. So no, I, I, I think we're incredibly dangerous point right now where we're like French President Macron said, it just doesn't work when you're at war with everybody and currently we are. So I've certainly been publicly and privately encouraging this president, fine, use this as negotiating leverage, but conclude the negotiations so that we really can prevent a or present a united front. <laughs> the rest of the trading world demanding that China follow the rules. Um, you know, I had two opportunities as a smaller manufacturer to put a manufacturing plant in China. And we went down the road in great detail. Both times I decided against it. Uh, our patent laws now, I'm, I don't like our patent law in the US. So we have our trade secrets as trade secrets. And I knew the minute I would open up a manufacturing plant, we would lose all that. And American businesses, we, we met with the American Chamber of Commerce. They went into China realizing they were going to lose that technology. They were kind of betting on the come that a 1.4 billion person market was worth it and they'd, they'd renew the uh, you know, th their technology. So again, th this is about realistically understanding and assessing what China's long-term strategy is, realizing that their advantage is, is long-term thinking. Our advantage, by the way, is a free market system that more efficiently, not perfectly, but more efficiently allocates capital. That's still a problem with them, although as central planners, they got really smart people doing the central planning. So what are Ron Johnson's favorite words of strategy? <clears throat> And Ron really brings that to the U.S. Senate. We need a strategy, a long-term strategy that relates to a relationship with China. Um, the Chinese, their, their uh, leadership is very smart. They're very savvy. They're long-term thinkers. And to quote uh, David Perdue, he called it China Inc. I think we were there. The way they grow and develop their leadership is remarkable. We all came from the private sector. I was 13 years at Procter & Gamble. It's noted as being a great company that grows its people, brings some of the best talent in and grow at the top. The Chinese have an amazing way that they move their leadership around. Uh, Xi Jinping's a chemical engineer, for heaven's sakes. I mean, they, they, have, they take some of their best and brightest. They move them kind of into state-owned enterprise, governor relationships, mayor relationships, move them off in the bureau in Beijing. My last visit to Shanghai, I met with the party secretary in Shanghai. That's the big guy in Shanghai. That's the job that Xi Jinping had earlier. That's the guy who's on his way to Beijing to develop a relationship with the, the next generation of leadership in China. As it relates to what's going on in terms of strategy, I think we can't go about this alone. I applaud President Trump for putting disruptive forces into this relationship needed to be confronted. This does not, this does not end well for the United States without confronting the outright theft and so forth of China of intellectual property that had to be confronted. However, I think a multilateral approach will be a better approach, both as it relates to our, our uh, Asian allies and TPP in Asia Pacific, or whether it's NATO over to confront the threat of Russia. I think multilateral needs to be part of the strategic thinking longer term. Well, I, I'd just like to add to that. Uh, the trade rules we have around the world are very imbalanced. But we wrote those rules. We did. I was part of that last four years. And I lived through it, quoted duty systems and all that. These are abrogations that create an opportunity to develop the third world. That was one of our missions in life. We did the Marshall Plan in Europe. We did the Marshall Plan in Asia. Eisenhower talked about developing the economy in Europe and Asia, and we did that. We did it through our trade relations. We opened up the U.S. market. 
Globalization was accelerated because of the way the U.S. helped develop the third world. Now, we did it with our trade, we did it with our policies here, and we did it with the U.S. military. Because when I lived in Singapore, about one out of every five ships that came through the Malacan Strait had a piracy issue. You couldn't go across the Pacific Ocean in the 50s and 60s and be guaranteed you'd get there without the secure support of the U.S. Navy. So what we have done with our trade rules is develop the third world, and we need to remember that. We don't get enough credit for that. We have reduced global poverty, and I say we because we were the driving force by that, um, by more than 60%. And since 65, by the way, the great war on poverty and all that, we haven't touched our, we haven't changed our poverty rate in the United States one iota. Um, we can talk about partisan politics if you want to, but let's stay on China for a minute. I believe that the opportunity right now has never been greater. President Trump's instincts are right. I don't like tariffs, but it's a disruptive, as Steve just says, the best word I can describe is disruptive. It got their attention. One thing we all probably will agree on, we, we talked about when we were there, it was obvious when we're meeting these top leaders from Li Keqiang, the premier of China, on down, we have their attention. I don't think, that, I think they misread the eight years with Barack Obama. They saw a disengagement with the rest of the world. This guy, Trump, comes back in and says, wait a minute, NATO, we're going to pull out if you don't start paying your fair share. It's a $400 billion delta that we've been subsidizing in Europe, uh, national defense. We have an unlevel playing field in regard to trade. President Trump is, dis is disrupting that. The Chinese are nervous about that. They're vulnerable right now. They've got a lot of debt. You can't see it because it's pushed down in the SOEs. It's pushed down in other quasi-companies like that. Uh, they need our markets right now, but I don't like the trade, the tr the using trade to the degree we are now because sooner or later, you have to come off of that path talking about tariffs to move over to now talk about bilateral uh, reciprocity. Let me give you an example. If Alibaba can do cloud computing here, we should be able to do cloud computing in China. It's just that simple. And as Ron said when we were over there, if we can move to that dialogue, that's when you make progress. You find win-win situations. These broad instrument approaches really don't work. It, trade is a matrix, it's a 3D matrix. It's countries, it's industries, and it's products. And if you start dealing with entire <coughs> industries, then you're gonna make mistakes, you're gonna pick winners and losers, and that's where we are right now. If I learn one thing in my business career, as you said earlier, uncertainty is the great devil in terms of trying to plan for business growth. It's just, you can't do it. And right now, there is great uncertainty. After we worked on uh, regulation, energy, taxes in the last 15 months, and Dodd-Frank, we've released six trillion dollars back into this economy, guys. This economy is, is just about to recover a lot of its lost ground over the last 15 years. I would love to have had a year or two to let that economy breathe a little bit, but the president's right. He's striking while the iron's hot. He believes the opportunity is there is to get a better deal for our manufacturers and our workers. So we've just got to suffer through a period while we're getting their attention. And you know, I, I talked to a bunch of soybean farmers the other day, and I actually had a conversation with one of the top media people in town here as a Sunday morning anchor, and, and they just don't understand you know, what the soybean farmers are really getting hit by these tariffs. They really are. And yet they are extremely supportive of the president's agenda. They see a bigger picture here. And that's what we have to, I think we have to get through that. But I am worried about the winners and losers in the, in the short term. So on, on the sophistication too of China that's going on and see Bill there, um, we were there, we visited with Jack Ma in, in Hangzhou. At two hours with Jack, we got a chance to see their amazing grocery store. I think of Whole Foods on steroids. And 70% of those consumers, don't come to the store. They order on the mobile device, delivered to their doorstep within 30 minutes on electric lights. <clears throat> so when we think about China, I said the only thing more dangerous in the center that's never been to China is one who was there 10 or 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was in Shanghai, and I went back for a separate trip to look at the avionics, and I met with Honeywell, GE, Boeing, and I met with my Procter & Gale, my blood still flows blue, there's an old PG guy. But uh, the, the business is doing very well over there, by the way. Um, but I, but here, here's the inner side. They take me to the largest Starbucks in the world is in Shanghai. So we, they said, they've got to take the American guy into the Starbucks, right? Give him a cup of coffee. So I walk in, and it's an amazing, amazing facility. State of the art. I mean, you've got very, very hip Chinese employees in there taking care of you. I wanted to buy a nice coffee mug to take home to my wife that says Shanghai Starbucks. So I went to the counter, we were in a hurry to get to the next meeting. I had some renminbi in my pocket, I pulled it out, and she looked at me like I was Lewis and Clark on expedition. <laughs> <laughs> like, cash, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, this is a Luddite in America. <laughs> and I said, oh, oh, sorry, so the Navy escort said, Steve, I'll, I'll take care of it, I know we gotta go in here, I'll get it on my credit card. And he pulls out a credit card. 
and they look at him like, what? A credit card? Are you kidding me? So, uh, you know, it's Alipay, it is, it's all on your phone. And, and I think, uh, as I was flying back in a long flight, reflecting on why in the world are we in this position where China has advanced so rapidly, and we're sitting here in many ways asleep at the switch. And uh, I thought, you know, it was probably a moment on 9-11, right? It was that moment that shifted this country, our defenses, our mind share went to the fight against radical Islam and Al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, and we had, that was the fight we had to fight for 17 years. But I think it, de it developed some complacency in the United States relates to China, because we were focused somewhere else. Uh, I was sharing that thought at a recent event I was doing with some defense contractors, and one of the individuals there says, I just, you said that, I just got chills. You know why? I was meeting with Don Rumsfeld that day when the plane hit the Pentagon, talking about our China strategy. We basically had to tear it up and move to the fight in the Middle East. So let me quick add, because as I heard the story in China, the whole movement to direct pay with Alipay, whatever, that was a conscious government decision, taking a look at that and go, credit cards are very inefficient. Okay. Can you imagine what it would be like to try and get rid of credit cards in America here, politically? Couldn't do it. But China said, no, this is far more efficient. Let's, let's cut out this middleman. We'll allow this, we'll encourage this direct pay. And again, they're, they're leapfrog. They, they take a look at the American example, whether it's in our factories, taking pictures of those, and then, you know, again, I'm, I'm manufacturer. I would love to have had my 10th extruder, or my first extruder be my 10th extruder, because you continue to improve it. So they've taken what we've got, and they've improved on it, they're leapfrogging us.